Hey everyone, Lauren Mulrain here with you again with uh, part six of our copyright study under the course. Again, um, the course is a series of videos that talks about different issues and different deals in the entertainment business. And we decided to start off with just a basic look at copyright with a series of, of uh, videos that talk about some of the more important areas of copyright. Um, and today we're on part six of that series and we're covering something called secondary liability. Secondary liability. So the, the concept really is that a person can possibly be liable for copyright infringement even if they are not the specific person who did the act of infringing. There are certain circumstances where you might be responsible for the actions of another. And these are called uh, vicarious liability or contributory infringement. There's a very uh, basic equation I like to use to explain um, or to define what those are. For vicarious liability, you need to show that there was benefit and control. The person who you're holding liable had a benefit that came from that infringement and had some means of controlling that um, infringing activity. For contributor, contributory liability, you must show that the person had knowledge and participation. So they had knowledge of the activity and they had some active participation in what was going on. So again, vicarious equals benefit plus control or V equals B plus C. And contributory liability requires knowledge and participation or C equals K plus P. Now that doctrine of contributory infringement comes from a tort um, doctrine, stems from the principle that one who directly contributes to another's infringement should be held accountable. And so copyright law has really adopted that tort law theory. Now there are a couple of extremes uh, when you look at cases and, and whether or not someone might be found liable for infringement. Let me give you a couple of the, the wide-ranging um, options. One is a case called Electra Records versus Gem Electronic Distributors. And this particular case is on the, the very extreme side of someone um, being held liable, where the store owner sold blank cassette tapes. For a fee, they loaned out uh, pre-recorded tapes of albums to their, their um, buyers. And then they provided a system in the store for these buyers to make copies of the CDs. Case illustrates the contributory infringement principle. And as you can see, um, there was a great deal of knowledge and participation on the part of um, the defendant in that case. And thus they were held liable for infringement. The opposite end of a spectrum where one was not found to be liable is a case called Perfect 10 Inc. versus Visa International Services. In this case, the court held, the Ninth Circuit held, that credit card companies could not be held liable for the contributory infringement when the only involvement they had was that their cards were used to um, make the purchases of this infringing material online. So you see those, those extremes there. The most complex cases typically lie somewhere in between those extremes. So you might have something where the defendant has done nothing more than supply materials or equipment, but that's it, right? Or maybe the equipment or materials can be used for both infringing and non-infringing purposes. Again, you know, we, we would need to see some other facts in order to determine whether or not there would be uh, infringement as a contributory infringer or vicarious liability. Uh, in one of our earlier videos, we talked about the Sony versus Universal City Studios case, 1983 case involving the early days of the home video recorder. In that particular case, the Supreme Court held that the manufacturer of the Betamax was not liable for contributory infringement when someone uh, used their machine to make copies of on-air uh, television shows. Um, after that case, the, the holding led to the 
um, seller or manufacturer of copying equipment such as typewriters, photocopy machines, um, computers, VCRs, etc., will not be held liable for contributory infringement, even if some buyers will predictably use the machine for copyright infringement. Even if it's likely that some people are going to use this machine in an infringing manner, that would not um, bring the uh, creator of the machine or the, the manufacturer of the machine under uh, the auspices of contributory infringement. So um, there was a case called Fona Visa versus Cherry Auction, where, where we saw both vicarious liability and contributory infringement. Um, Fona Visa is a, a record company. Um, Cherry Auction was a, a, a company that owned a, a, basically a flea market or swap meet. And they were paid a daily rental fee for um, space. They, paid, they were paid uh, funds from admissions from the public who came to um, the venue. They received parking fees. They received receipts from concession stands. And um, they retained the right to exclude any vendor for any reason at any time. So with all of this, we saw benefit. We saw control, we saw knowledge, we saw participation. Um, and with regard to the knowledge piece, there had actually been a time when the sheriff's office had raided um, the site and, and confiscated some infringing bootleg materials. So the knowledge was certainly there on the part of a cherry auction. Um, they could not escape that piece. With regard to participation, they provided the space. They provided utilities, they provided parking, they provided advertising, they provided plumbing, they provided customers, and all of that um, led to their liability in that case. So, in a nutshell, it is possible to be liable for secondary copyright infringement as a contributory infringer or through vicarious liability. Remember the formula in order to be liable for vicarious liability, V equals B plus C, you need to have benefit and control. And in order to be liable for contributory infringement, K plus P, contributory infringement requires knowledge plus participation. All right, that's all for today. We'll see you next time around.